I'm Marty. I'm a third year pharmacy student. And if you're like me, pharmacy school can get pretty overwhelming. So it's nice to have a quick review of a topic like heart failure. So if you're feeling a little like this guy, or like this one, then hopefully this video will help you. So in this heart failure video, we're going to be talking about the pathophysiology of heart failure and some of the drugs that can be used to combat it, both in acute situations and in chronic situations. The most common cause of heart failure is coronary artery disease, or the buildup of atheromas or plaques within the coronary arteries. This buildup of plaques is caused by a combination of factors including hypertension, cholesterol, and inflammation. Depending upon the size of the plaque, blood flow to the heart can be affected, thereby affecting oxygen delivery to the heart. Now, coronary artery disease can lead to myocardial infarction or heart attack. This happens when the plaque within the artery wall ruptures, leading to platelet aggregation at the rupture site and clot formation. Clot formation results in a drastic decrease in blood flow, thereby preventing oxygen delivery to the heart. So as we've been discussing, both of these situations lead to decreased delivery of oxygen to the heart. And that can precipitate cardiac cell death or dysfunction, leading to heart failure. The most common manifestation of heart failure is decreased cardiac output, but the reason that this happens is due to malfunctions in excitation contraction coupling within the heart muscles. So first let's talk about the excitation contraction coupling process within the cardiac sarcomere. In a cardiac muscle sarcomere, there are several different transporters. On the far left is the sodium potassium ATPase. This transporter brings in potassium against its concentration gradient and exports sodium also against its concentration gradient. In the middle we have the sodium calcium exchanger and this brings in sodium with its concentration gradient in exchange for calcium. On the far right, we have the L-type calcium channel, which in response to neuronal activation, brings in calcium. Now within the sarcomere is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which serves to store calcium for use during contraction. So in normal excitation contraction coupling, the excitation of the neuron activates L-type calcium channels to let in a small amount of trigger calcium. Now this trigger calcium enters the sarcoplasmic reticulum, thereby activating the release of calcium through ryanidine receptors. This cytoplasmic calcium binds to the actin complex causing a conformational change that allows myosin heads to bind to actin and cause contraction of the heart muscle. So in heart failure, a few of these steps are malfunctioning. First, L-type calcium channels are less active in responding to excitation. Second, the response to calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is decreased, leading to decreased contraction capacity. Overall, these two malfunctions decrease cardiac output. Decreased cardiac output decreases the ability of the heart to supply oxygen to the body. As a result, the body tries to compensate to increase oxygen supply by increasing cardiac output. Now the body has several mechanisms it uses in order to increase cardiac output. 
and most of them have to do with regulation of blood pressure. So blood pressure is regulated by two different mechanisms, a short-term regulation through baroreceptor response and long-term regulation through the kidney. In baroreceptor regulation, baseline blood pressure is determined by constant sympathetic vasomotor stimulation by norepinephrine, which activates sympathetic alpha and beta receptors to maintain the blood pressure. Too much sympathetic activity can result in a blood pressure that is high. A high blood pressure stretches the blood vessel walls, activating baroreceptors in the carotid sinus. Activation of the baroreceptors blocks the sympathetic outflow, thereby lowering the systemic blood pressure. But in heart failure, the decreased cardiac output decreases blood pressure, thereby preventing stretching of the blood vessel walls and decreasing the activation of baroreceptors in the carotid sinus. This results in basically an unblocked sympathetic norepinephrine outflow. This norepinephrine then goes on to increase the force of heart contraction by interacting with beta-1 receptors in the heart and increases the rate of contraction also through beta-1 receptors in the heart. Norepinephrine also serves to activate alpha-1 receptors in both the venous system, thereby increasing preload, and in the arterial system, thereby increasing afterload. Now, preload can be defined as the amount of filling pressure that the heart faces prior to contraction of the ventricles, whereas afterload can be defined as the amount of pressure the heart faces upon contraction of the ventricles, trying to push the blood out through the arterioles into the body. Now preload, since it's the filling pressure is determined by the blood volume and the capacitance of the venules, or their size whereas afterload is more determined by peripheral vascular resistance or the size or radius of the arterioles. Now, decreased cardiac output also manifests itself in long-term blood pressure control. So decreased cardiac output decreases blood flow to the kidney. That decreased blood flow to the kidney results in the release of renin, and renin eventually gets converted into angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 does a lot of different things in the body. Uh, the first and main thing that it is is a potent vasoconstrictor, so it's going to increase the peripheral vascular resistance by constricting the arterioles. And so that's going to increase afterload. Another thing that angiotensin does is activates the release of aldosterone. And aldosterone works in the distal tubule and collecting duct of the kidney to increase the retention of sodium and water, basically serving to increase blood flow to the kidney by increasing blood volume. But what that does in heart failure is actually increases the filling pressure or the preload on the heart. Angiotensin II also happens to increase norepinephrine levels, which just serves to further increase the sympathetic outflow, increasing again force rate, preload, and afterload. Angiotensin II is also responsible for remodeling of the heart, which is when the heart's ventricles dilate in order to increase its filling capacity basically in an effort to increase cardiac output because the more blood the heart can take on, the more it can pump out, the greater the stroke volume. So the last thing to mention here is the negative feedback of angiotensin, which prevents renin release. Now, sympathetic outflow from 
The short-term blood pressure control on this side of the chart can also impact long-term control through beta receptors in the kidney. So the increased norepinephrine from sympathetic outflow activates beta-1 receptors in the kidney, which also activates renin release. So initially, sympathetic increases that occur as a result of compensation do actually increase cardiac output. But over the long run, the increase in peripheral vascular resistance decreases cardiac output. Okay, so there are several ways in which drugs can impact the pathophysiology we've talked about. So first we're going to talk about the drugs that can be used in chronic heart failure. And then we'll talk about the drugs that can be used in acute heart failure. So in chronic heart failure, excitation contraction coupling can be impacted by two drugs. Digoxin can block the sodium potassium ATPase which prevents the outflow of sodium against its concentration gradient, thereby preventing the influx of sodium into the cell. Since sodium can't come in, calcium can't go out, and you end up with an increased concentration of calcium inside the cell. Now, why is that a good thing? Well, the increased calcium in the cell can be stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum for later use during contraction such that the increased stores of calcium provide an, a greater force of contraction when the next neuronal signal comes. Now, beta blockers can also impact coupling by increasing the activity of the L-type calcium channels. In chronic heart failure, there are many mechanisms to impact the compensatory reaction that the body has to a decreased cardiac output. So first, beta blockers can be used to block the effects of increased sympathetic flow on beta-1 receptors both in the heart and in the kidneys. So the blockage of beta-1 receptor activation in the heart decreases the heart rate, which allows the heart more time to fill completely, increasing the stroke volume and thereby increasing cardiac output. Currently, there are only three beta blockers that are used in heart failure, and that's mainly because they've been used extensively in clinical trials with heart failure patients and have been shown to be effective. And those are carvedilol, metoprolol, and bisoprolol. An important note here, however, is that beta blockers can only be used in stable patients and cannot be used in acute heart failure. Constriction of the venous system by alpha-1 activation through sympathetic outflow can be counteracted by the addition of nitrates. Now, nitrates are converted to nitric oxide within the smooth muscle of the vessels, which causes vasodilation, thereby decreasing preload. Next is hydralazine. And hydralazine is a direct vasodilator that works mostly on the arterioles, which is going to counteract the effect of alpha-1 activation in the arterioles, seen as a result of sympathetic outflow. The result of this is decreased afterload. So next are diuretics, and diuretics act by increasing the secretion of sodium and water into the urine, thereby decreasing blood volume and decreasing preload. Usually we use loop diuretics since they are the most efficient diuretics. Spironolactone is also a diuretic used in heart failure but it's used less for its diuretic effects and more for its effects on aldosterone. And aldosterone normally serves to precipitate the remodeling of the heart, so spironolactone blocks its effects, thereby blocking remodeling. ACE inhibitors, or ARBs, are also used to combat the compensatory mechanisms that occur as a result of decreased renal blood flow. 
So ACE inhibitors or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors prevent the formation of angiotensin 2 from angiotensin 1. ARBs or angiotensin receptor blockers prevent the binding of angiotensin 2 to its receptors. Either way, both of these agents serve to prevent the actions of angiotensin as we discussed earlier. Blocking the actions of angiotensin 2 will help to decrease the peripheral vascular resistance that occurs as a result of vasoconstriction, thereby decreasing afterload. The blockage of angiotensin 2's effects on aldosterone will also prevent its effects on the retention of sodium in water, thereby decreasing blood volume and decreasing preload. Blockage of angiotensin 2's effects on norepinephrine will decrease the sympathetic outflow that's normally seen. And lastly, ACE inhibitors and ARBs will help to prevent the remodeling that occurs as a result of angiotensin 2 activation. Acute heart failure occurs when cardiac output declines so low that the patient accumulates fluid in their lungs or extremities or can no longer perfuse their organs properly. In this kind of situation, patients will present differently and must be treated based on their symptoms. Patients with decreased organ perfusion usually require the use of positive inotropes. The positive inotropes that affect excitation contraction coupling are in amrinone and milrinone. Now, enamrinone and milrinone are PDE3 inhibitors, which means that they prevent the breakdown of cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP. So increases in cyclic AMP increase the calcium levels in the cell, which again, similar to digoxin, increase the force of contraction and cardiac output. Increases in cyclic GMP cause vasodilation, which allows for better blood flow to the organs while the heart is increasing its force of contraction. Drugs used in acute heart failure that affect the compensatory mechanisms include drugs like dobutamine and dopamine. Now, dobutamine and dopamine are both beta-1 agonists which serve to increase the force and rate of contraction in an acute situation to increase cardiac output. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. And I hope your test goes like this and not like this. Have a good one.